Hi everybody, my name is Christian Cooper. I'm a third year acting candidate at the University of Southern Mississippi, and I'm here to do a how-to video on the introduction of Scansion for Shakespeare. Um, I am a TA for the acting styles class that we offer here at the university, and one of the things I'm noticing is that a lot of the students are having a hard time uh, with Scansion. Um, and I think scansion is just one of those things that uh, when you first approach it, it can seem very complicated, very foreign. So I'm hoping this video will uh, help you uh, fi uh, be able to make sense of it, be able to approach it and be maybe less scared of it. It's like a muscle. It's, it just needs to be exercised. Uh, it, just, it just takes practice. In order for this video to get underway, um, you will need to know some basic terms when it comes to measuring rhythm and measuring meter in terms of poetry. I'll be using terms such as iams, trochee, anapest, uh, iambic pentameter, that's a big one. So I'm going to put a link right here. If you don't know those terms, uh, watch this video. Um, this guy gives a very thorough explanation as to what these terms mean, and I think he can explain them far better than I can. What this video is going to focus on is scansion when you're performing Shakespeare. So, Shakespeare wrote, um, first of all, when you're performing Shakespeare and you notice that, sh that he's written in verse, you will have two very broad types of lines of poetry, regular lines and irregular lines. If the line is regular, what that means is it is written in perfect iambic pentameter. Now, if you've watched that video, you know that iambic pentameter is a line of poetry that is five iams, an iam being an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable, and there are five of them in one line. Ba 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 But soft what light through yonder window breaks. It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon. That's regular iambic pentameter. That's the rhythm of poetry that Shakespeare uses. I'm going to say, I'm going to pull a number out of my ass 87% of the time. That's that's just a complete number I just made up on the spot. It's his normal rhythm. Uh, that's what we mean when we say regular lines. Because obviously we wouldn't go... We wouldn't watch two to sometimes three hours of Shakespeare where they're talking in that rhythm the entire time. Ba 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 Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, so on and so forth, right? So, if you're just going to speak it naturally anyway, why do we need to know this rhythm? Why do we need to scan our text? Well, the answer is, what we're looking for when we scan Shakespeare is we're looking for the irregularities. Whenever Shakespeare breaks that rhythm, that iambic pentameter, it's usually a clue as to the character's state of being. You know, when you listen to the iambic rhythm, if you tap it on your chest, it sounds kind of like a heartbeat. And that's how I like to think about it. It sounds a lot like a heartbeat. And if you have an irregular heartbeat, something's wrong, right? So it's the same thing with the character. The character is speaking in this heartbeat-like rhythm. And if they break that rhythm, there's something going on with them psychologically. So when you're scanning your text, Look for the irregularities and try to see if you can figure out what that means for the character. The most common type of irregularity you will find in Shakespeare is the feminine ending. A feminine ending is an extra unstressed syllable at the end of verse. Ba 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 ba. This is present. We see this in what is arguably the most famous line in all of Shakespeare: "To be or not to be." That is the quest. So, what does that mean? Well, depending on who you ask, having an extra syllable at the end of verse um, 
it's it's really up for interpretation. It's definitely a clue for you. You you definitely need to take that and think why is this character speaking with an extra unstressed syllable at the end? What's going on with them psychologically? Uh, some scholars will tell will say that having an extra unstressed syllable ending weakly uh, means that it's the character is vulnerable in that moment. That this is a moment of weakness for them. Uh, some will say that that extra unstressed stress syllable sets up the next line of verse. The point is, it's a moment for you as the actor to look at that line and try to figure out what's going on with the character. Uh, another thing you'll see, another form of irregularity in Shakespeare is use of a trochee. Now once again, a trochee is the opposite of an I am. It's a stress syllable followed by an unstress syllable. But, but. Um, and oftentimes you'll see these most commonly at the very beginning of a line. Uh, if you look at the to be or not to be speech, to be or not to be, that is the question. You have the feminine ending. But if you go on to the next line, uh, it goes, whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer. Say the word whether. How do you pronounce whether? Which syllable gets the stress? You wouldn't say whether. You'd say whether. It's the first syllable. The word whether is a trochee. So that line scans with a trochee at the beginning, whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer, and it has a feminine ending again. So once again, this is a clue for you as the actor playing Hamlet to try to figure out what is going on with Hamlet in this moment. Why is he speaking with not only a feminine ending at the end of that line, but why does that line start with a trochee? Now, the way I learned it, I learned that if you have a trochee at the beginning of a line, what that means is that that line is important for the character. This interpretation makes sense to me when you think about the audience that Shakespeare was writing for. Uh, Shakespeare was writing during a time period in which there were no cell phones, there was no television, there were no movies, there was no radio, uh, and the majority of the Elizabethan culture was illiterate. So they couldn't even read for entertainment. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, it means that theater was pretty much the only form of entertainment. But it also means that this was a very verbal culture. This was a culture that communicated a lot. Because of this, they were very good at listening to each other. Uh, if you look, think about the word audience, uh, the root word being audio, to listen, right? These people would go to hear a play, not to see a play, but to hear a play. Uh, if you think about the word rehearsal, uh, the rehearsal comes from the Greek uh, word f which means to rehear the play. The Elizabethan culture would be very good at picking up this rhythm. So if Shakespeare is writing in this constant iambic pentameter, and then all of a sudden he switches it, starts with a trochee at the beginning, while the audience might not know intellectually what he's doing, they would still feel that. They would notice the shift in rhythm. So it makes sense that if Shakespeare wanted to highlight a particular line, it's like whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer, he would start it with a trochee to make sure the audience could hear that. So that line, because it starts with a trochee, is important. So why, what is it about that line that makes that important to Hamlet? Now, this monologue, as we know, is a monologue where he's contemplating suicide. So often I've seen this monologue done, people take that concept and run with it, and they really, uh, for lack of a better word, masturbate it. They, they, you know, really get all emotional and to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows, and I'm already asleep. There is no action being played. If you remember that Hamlet is first and foremost an intellectual, that he, the reason he spends four hours of the play before he finally kills Claudius, is that he overanalyzes everything. This monologue is Hamlet weighing the pros and cons of whether it's better to live with depression or to end it all. So he starts, to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, 
whether it's better to live with the pain of life or to take arms against a sea of troubles or to fight or to take our destiny into our own hands to end our own lives, then you can see how this internal argument, this internal struggle that he's going through is important to him. And once again, you can see that in the verse. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer, starts with a trochee, ends with a feminine ending. The next line, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, uh, feminine ending. Or to take arms. I would argue that this line begins with a trochee. Or to take arms against a sea of troubles, feminine ending. And by opposing, end them. And he goes on and on. So that's the trochee at the beginning. Another thing you'll see with Shakespeare, another form of irregularity, is the medial trochee, where you'll have a trochee in the middle of the line. So let's take another look at to be or not to be. Uh, this is one where you have artistic license. You could scan it regularly, except with the feminine ending at the end, to be or not to be, that is the question. But you could also make the argument that the word that is more important than is. To be or not to be, that is the question. And then you have a trochee as the third foot. So once again, that's an indicator that there's something going on with Hamlet psychologically. Another thing I want to talk about is the idea of complex rhythm versus elision. So if you watch the video, you know that there are some feet in which you have three syllables. You have anapest, which is two unstressed syllables followed by a stress syllable, or a dactyl, which is the opposite. You have a stress syllable followed by two unstressed syllables. You can see that in action if we go back to, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks. That, that line is regular. But if you go on to the next line, it is the east and Juliet is the sun. We have what could be an anapest in that line. It is the east and Juliet is the sun. Or we can elide the word Juliet. We can pronounce it with two syllables. It is the east and Juliet is the sun. So that's one of those examples in which um, it's up to you as the actor to figure out how stable is Romeo in that moment. If he's more stable, it might be better to pronounce Juliet with only the two syllables. It is the east and Juliet is the sun. But if you think he's filled to the brink with passion for love of Juliet, maybe he's a little less stable. Maybe it makes more sense to use the anapest there. It is the east and Juliet is the sun. Another example of this is in the to be or not to be speech. You have the one line that reads, the heartache and the thousand natural shocks, blah, 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 that flushes air too. If you were to scan it, you'd find that you have an extra syllable, the heartache and the thousand natural shocks. Now we can do that with the anapest at the end, natural shocks, or we could elide the word natural and pronounce it with two syllables, the heartache and the thousand natural shocks. Once again, that's where you as the actor have to figure out how stable is Hamlet in that moment. Either way is correct. Sometimes you'll work with a director who will tell you to do it a specific way. In that case, uh, your work is easy because he'll either tell you to use the anapest and you know that Hamlet is less stable, or he'll tell you to elide the word natural and you know that he's a little bit more stable in that moment. Elision is a tool you can use if you notice that after counting a line, if you notice you have X, one extra syllable, or sometimes two extra syllables, um, but you think it needs to be more regular, or if you have, let's say, 11 syllables, but you really think that last one should be stressed, elision is a tool you can use to keep the, the rhythm regular. Look for words like over, which could be elided to o'er, or heaven, which would, could be elided to heaven. Oftentimes you'll see in Shakespeare, uh, the, depending on the edition, the editors have already elided it for you. A lot of times you'll see it, uh, stuff like this, where it reads, like Naya B, all tears, why she, in she, where even is elided to Ian. That's an example of one word being elided. Another example is you can have two words elided together. An example of that would be, once again, in the to be or not to be monologue, in the line that patient merits of the unworthy takes, you could see it written uh, like so, that patient merits of the unworthy takes, where the and unworthy are elided together to keep the, word, the rhythm uh, regular. 
a patient merit of the unworthy takes. Something else you may see in Shakespeare is what's called the midline feminine ending, or epic sejura, if you want to get pretentious about it. This is where you have a feminine ending in the middle of the line. So, for example, and by opposing end them to die to sleep. If you were to scan that, and by opposing ends them to die to sleep. Now, you could argue that there's an ant, that that's an anapest in the middle of there. And by opposing ends them to die to sleep. And that would be a correct answer. But since you have that colon after them, if you want to get fancy, you could argue that them is a midline feminine ending. And that the rhythm starts over with to die to sleep. Once again, either one is correct, and either way, it's an irregular line, so something's going on with Hamlet, psychologically, in that moment. Something else you may see in Shakespeare, another form of irregularity, you may have a whole extra foot of verse. If you scan a line, you may find that it's not iambic pentameter, but that it's iambic hexameter, that there are 12 syllables, that there's a whole extra iam at the end. This is a little bit more rare, but it does happen. An example of this would be in Richard III's Now, now is the Winner of Our Discontent monologue. He has a line where he says, I that am rudely stamped and want love's majesty. If you count the syllables, you'll find that you have a whole extra iam at the end. And what that usually means if you have an extra foot is that the character is in a very heightened state of emotion. They're so emotional and what they're saying is so important to them that what they have to say cannot be said with just 10 syllables. They need that extra foot. They need that extra I am. And oftentimes, if you have that extra I am, you may also notice that that line also begins with a trochee. You could also scan this line uh, with I having the stress, if you want to argue that this is so important to him that this line begins with a trochee. I, that am rudely stamped and want love's majesty. And this makes sense why he has that extra foot in that moment. He's talking about how ugly he is and how he wants love. I, that am rudely stamped. I, that it was born ugly and want love's majesty. I want love, but I was born rudely stamped, and I, he goes on to say that dogs bark at me as I halt by them. So you can see how Richard would be emotional in this moment, and you see that in the verse. The next thing I want to talk about, not every director will agree with, but I want you to bring your attention to it. If you have a string of monosyllabic syllables, meaning if you have a line of verse and every single word it has only one syllable, most scholars will tell you that that means that that portion of the, of the verse is very direct and very important to the point where you can pronounce all of those words with the same amount of emphasis, that they will all be stressed. For example, uh, this is a line from Richard II's Hollow Crown speech. Uh, he says, how some have been deposed, some slain in war. Now, you can scan this regularly, how some have been deposed, some slain in war. But when I did it for my Shakespeare class, I chose to take that one section, some slain in war. All of them, all of those words are monosyllabic. So I chose to stress all of those words equally. What this speech is about is... Uh, Richard is coming to terms with his mortality. He's realizing that just because he's a king, that doesn't mean he's never going to die. And he's talking about how all the kings before him have met their perilous ends, I guess. And he says how some have been deposed, and then he says some slain in war. This is particularly important to Richard because he's fighting a war right now. He's fighting a war with Bolingbroke, who is coming to depose him. So I chose to use that string of monosyllabic words and stress them all equally. How some have been deposed, some slain in war. Another thing you'll see with Shakespeare, if you are playing a magical creature, like say you're playing Puck from A Midsummer Night's Dream, or the witches in Macbeth, the magical creatures in Shakespeare, their regular rhythm is different than the mortals. Shakespeare is trying to emphasize these magical characters. So oftentimes they won't be speaking in iambic pentameter. They'll be speaking in trochaic tetrameter. Double, double, toil and trouble. Or if you think about Puck from Midsummer, If we shadows have offended, think but this and all is mended. Now, Puck doesn't talk in 
trochaic tetrameter the entire play, but you as the actor have to figure out what that means when the character, when the magical creature whose regular rhythm is trochaic tetrameter, what does it mean when they drop into the speech of the mortals, the iambic pentameter? And the final form of irregularity in Shakespeare that I want to bring your attention to is if their rhythm is completely effed up. Uh, usually this happens when a character is gone mad. When a character goes mad in Shakespeare, and there are a couple characters in Shakespeare that are sort of losing their sanity, you can think about Lear, Lady M, um, Hamlet, some would argue, uh, you can evaluate how far gone the character is by how messed up their rhythm is. That's what's cool about Scansion. If you look at Ophelia's mad scene uh, in Hamlet, her rhythm, her meter, is so effed up that you know that this character is gone, that there is no hope for her. She speaks with two anapests per line. Uh, she'll start with a trochee, speak, have two anapests. She'll end with feminine endings. And the thing is that she's not even consistent. Each line differs in rhythm. Ophelia in that scene is gone. She, like, she has completely lost her sanity. And that's what the rhythm tells us. So that's all the examples of irregularity in Shakespeare. I also want to bring your attention to some tricks you can use to keep a line regular. We talked about elision, how you can take, um, if you have too many syllables, but you still think that it needs to be regular, if you, you still feel like that last 11th syllable needs to be stressed, you can elide it, heartache, and the thousand natural shocks that patient merit of the unworthy takes. Another thing you can do if you are short a couple syllables, um, if you only have nine syllables, uh, look for words that end in ed or ion. So, for example, a line from Henry V, the first monologue in Henry V, says the flat, unraised spirits that have dared. If you scan that uh, with the normal iambic pentameter, the flat, unraised spirits that hath dared. It, it got a little wonky, right? There's something off about that. If you count the syllables, there's only nine, right? Um, but it started to sound weird at spirits. The flat, unraised spirits. You don't say spirits, you say spirits, right? Um, but even after that, uh, I feel like dared should be stressed, uh, and, and that should be stressed. You know, if we want to keep it regular, one of the things we can do is we can... Uh, make the word unraised a little longer. The flat, unraised spirits that hath dared. That's one thing that, that's something Shakespeare does often. Uh, in Romeo and Juliet, uh, Juliet refers to how Romeo is banished. Not banished, banished. Because that's how you get the regular iambic pentameter. You can also do it with words that end in I-O-N. Uh, in that same speech from Henry V, the brightest heaven of invention we're short a syllable. Uh, so how do we get it so that it's regular? We have to take into account how words were pronounced back in those days. It would be the brightest heaven of invention. Ah. Now, how do you do that and make it sound natural? Well, if I'm doing that speech, I would gloss over it. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. That way it's there, but it's it's not that jarring. A couple other things you'll see in Shakespeare are what's called shared lines. This is where you, if you're, if you're in a scene with someone else and you have a line that's a bit short, it doesn't fit the full iambic pentameter, but then you notice that their line, which is immediately after yours, is also short, count the two of them together to see if together they make the full iambic pentameter because that's what's called a shared line. For, so an example of this would be in Othello. This is a scene I'm about to do with Sheldon. Uh, it's between Iago and Othello. Uh, Iago says, talking about Cassio, no more than he'll unswear, it's short. But then Othello comes in with what hath he said, also short. But if you put the two together, 
they scan perfectly into the iambic pentameter rhythm. No more than he'll unswear, what hath he said? Oftentimes you'll see additions that, uh, that will indent the second line so that it l looks like one line of verse, but not always. Sometimes you have to do the work yourselves. So look for that. It brings me to the next thing you'll see with Shakespeare, what's called a short line. So if you have a short line, uh, a line that doesn't fit the full iambic pentameter, um, and then the next line after that is a full line, it doesn't fit the description of a shared line, it can't complete the verse, then, that, then what you have is just simply a short line. So an example of this, once again in To Be or Not To Be, Hamlet has a line where he says, must give us pause, there's the respect, and then we're short, missing that final foot of verse. So that is a short line. Now what that means, if you have a short line, it means you can take a pause. Now the pause can be anywhere in that line. It can be before the line, it can be after the line, it can be in the middle of the line. And I think it's more than fitting that the line, that, that particular line of Shakespeare, that short line, has the word pause in the middle of it. So if I were playing Hamlet and I were delivering that speech, I would take the the pause right after the word pause must give us pause there's the respect and then go on as a matter of fact i would take the string of monosyllabic syllables at the beginning of the verse and play that must give us pause there's the respect now if you do take a pause if you have a short line make sure you're filling that pause you're doing something in that pause so that you, you know, it doesn't seem like once again, that you're masturbating the text. You have to do something. So, once again, the to be or not to be speech is a speech where Hamlet is weighing the pros and cons of committing suicide. So, if Hamlet takes that pause, he's taking a moment to consider before he goes on. If you look at the line in context with the rest of the speech, he's trying to figure out what will happen after Death. What dreams may come, he says, when we have shuffled off this mortal coil, must give us pause. And then you can take that pause to think about it. Is there a life after death? Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? Will I go to heaven? Will I go to hell? Or will it just be complete light, lights off? So that's everything I have on Scansion. I hope this has been helpful for you guys. Once again, Scansion, it may seem scary at first, but it just takes practice. When you approach a Shakespearean speech, read it out loud, really overdo that, that iambic rhythm, and listen for the irregularities, because they may be indicators of, some, of a deeper nuance that's happening with the characters. I hope this has been helpful for you guys. Take care, stay safe, wash your hands. Peace.